As you know, I'm new here to Ohio. I work in South Dakota for 10 years, so right next door to our speaker from Nebraska. I was the soybean entomologist at South Dakota State University for 10 years before coming here to Ohio. So I'm still getting to know Ohio and the problems in Ohio and, and the solutions in Ohio. And so I hope that maybe you all will have some information for me that, uh, that I haven't encountered yet because I'm still learning the state. So let's see if I can make this work. Okay, so today we are talking about slug. What is the number one thing that comes to your mind? Slimy, absolutely. We have slime. And for slugs to have slime, this is part of their biology, they need moist habitats. These are moisture-loving creatures, and they really require that to be happy and well. <coughs> slugs thrive in habitats that are moist, that are protected. They don't like a lot of agitation, uh, undisturbed, and where the temperatures are kind of moderate because they're soft body, they don't have a nice protective a shell like a lot of insects, they need moderated temperatures. All of this is very characteristic of no-till agriculture. And this being a conference of uh, no-till folks, I don't need to talk too much about the benefits of no-till. I'd be preaching to the choir. But one I want to draw your attention to in particular is the fact that no-till conserves soil moisture. Now that can be a really good thing, but it also has drawbacks in that the undisturbed nature of no-till, the lack of um, uh, lack of uh, temperature extremes that having that uh, soil residue can give you, and the increased soil moisture is all very favorable for slugs. And really, we can have slug problems in conventional fields, but uh, most of our slug problems really do occur in no-till fields. This tends to be a bigger problem in the eastern Corn Belt, uh, where we are here in Ohio and in the Middle Atlantic. Basically, places that have two things, high cover crop adoption, relatively speaking, and moisture. Now, I worked in soybeans for 10 years in South Dakota. In all those years, I had maybe one or two phone calls about slugs. Now, no-till is actually fairly highly adopted in South Dakota because of the soil uh, moisture properties. Why would I not have the slug problems? Anybody in South Dakota? No moisture. I wouldn't say no moisture, but very little moisture compared to what we have here. This is a precipitation map of the U.S. Uh, showing uh, average annual rainfall. And where I worked in eastern South Dakota was right here in this yellow zone, where we typically wouldn't have more than 20 to 25 inches of precipitation a year. Whereas over here in nice green lush Ohio, we've got upwards of maybe 40 uh, inches a year. Very different type of crop environment. So slugs are an increasing problem, not just uh, in spots, but in sort of collective recent memory. I think this has become more of a problem in the region for a few reasons. We've had a lot of cool, wet springs, which really encourages the slugs. We have more no-till than we used to. This is a, 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 something that is kind of growing with increased adoption. So more, more no-till fields, and fields that have been in no-till for longer. Uh, are things that encourage the slug buildup. Because slug populations don't just kind of happen overnight. A lot of them are kind of slow buildup, buildups over time. So it was less of a historical problem, and for that reason, there has not been uh, nearly as much research on slugs as field crop pests as there has on insects, for example. I'm an entomologist. Uh, and you know, there's decades and decades of work about insects and field crops. Not so much in slugs because it's a less of a historic problem, but also because it tends to be a regionally specific problem. And because it only happens in certain places that meet those criteria that I was talking about, uh, a lot of, there's been really a lack of research and development for companies to come up with slug products because it's just not a, a big enough market uh, for that. Um, there's also been a lack of USDA and federal funding uh, and nonprofit research investment. 
But I would say that over the last 10 years or so, there has been a lot more land grant research that's been happening, uh, particularly to serve um, the Nodrum community. And I'd like to give a shout out to my predecessor in my position, Ron Hammond, who was the field crop entomologist at Ohio State for many years. And uh, when he retired, uh, I took his position. And he was really one of the first people to do a lot of work on slugs uh, and to take an active interest in this. And uh, believe it or not, he is considered one of the world experts in slug research. He uh, often went to Europe, for example, to talk to no-till farmers there about slugs. So I'm going to go over a little bit about slug biology and damage. Uh, there are several different species that you might find in your fields, but really one of them is the dominant, the gray garden slug. You might come across marsh slugs, banded slugs, dusky slugs, but really it's the gray garden slug that's really the, the main driver of problems with slugs. Slugs are very plant feeding generalists. They can eat lots of different things. Now a lot of insect pests, to contrast that with, are pretty plant specific. They have to have one or just a few different types of plants to eat, but slugs can eat just about anything. Uh, and uh, just about any field crop that meets those conditions uh, might have problems with slugs if they have enough moisture and enough uh, protection and residue. So soybean and corn, that's what I uh, typically hear problems with in uh, Ohio, maybe uh, wheat and forages to some extent. This is uh, a picture taken in Ohio showing just how extreme the slug damage in corn can be. Basically, most of this field was wiped out, and this was definitely a replant situation in corn. Similarly, in soybean, oops. Uh, so it, this is a problem that can be pretty extreme, not just a few plants nibbled on. How many people here in the audience at one time or another in your careers have had slug problems in your fields? Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of hands there. So this is this a big deal. This was a picture taken in western Pennsylvania in Franklin County in 2012 at about 9 p.m. after the fellow had been mowing his hay. This is not hay residue on the mower head. This, my friends, is slugs. <laughs> This is another piece of equipment up the road, picture taken on the same night, different mower. Again, those are slugs. So it's no surprise, given how bad population slugs can be, that we can have yield losses in the Middle Atlantic and the Eastern Corn Belt approaching 20% or even more, depending on the field that's being hit. Uh, just generally speaking, I think the damage potential is worse in soybean because the growing point is exposed and if the growing point gets eaten, the plant is done for, whereas corn with its sort of protected hidden growing point has a better chance of uh, uh, bouncing back from being fed on, but once that growing point is gone from feeding, you know, that's it. You're looking at a replant situation for sure. And slugs can also feed on weeds and organic matter, which is relevant because if the crop hasn't come up yet, but they're in the field and they need something to keep them going, uh, a field that has a lot of organic matter or weeds provides an extra food source to kind of keep them, keep them going until the crop is there. Slugs have a food chain. At the bottom of the food chain, the things they eat, crops, weeds and other food plants, and then believe it or not, they can actually go carnivore a little bit. They can eat earthworms. Um, not their main source of, of, uh, of food, but they can do it. So then you've got the slugs eating these crops, and plants, and then you have the predators, in particular ground beetles. And ground beetles are very important as predators of slugs, and I'm going to talk more about that towards the end of this talk. The slug life cycle is in three parts. You have the eggs, and the single green garden slug can get up to 500 eggs. They look like little clear BBs. The juveniles are just baby slugs, very small, and then they grow into uh, the, the larger adults over time. And these adults can live more than one year. So they can live a year, overwinter, and then come out again the following year. I don't think we actually really know what is the maximum amount of time a slug can live in nature, but certainly more than one year. 
the life cycle of a slug is not well synchronized. It's not like there are these perfectly spaced, first their eggs, and this happens at this time of year. It's more overlapping. You can get eggs. This line represents eggs and egg laying that can happen throughout the spring. Some of these eggs can also overwinter. They might get laid in the fall and they spend the winter and then they hatch in the spring. You can have juveniles, adults, and uh, uh, mature slugs throughout the year. But the peak of the damage in field crops, especially soybeans, typically occurs from mid-April to mid-June. Uh, a lot of this damage happens from the first crop of juveniles. Now this is important to keep in mind that as the juveniles get bigger, the slug problems get worse because the bigger the slug, the more they eat. So if we have slugs that are coming out in full force as juveniles in April and they're getting bigger and bigger and eating more and more crop, your crop planting time becomes important. Because if you have smaller plants, if you plant late, and you've got small little plants and these great big fat slugs, that's when you're going to have the greatest damage potential. So uh, and when thinking about management, planting early and giving the plants a head start is one of the tactics that we can use to not really eliminate the slugs, but try to get the crops past danger. So now I'm going to talk a bit about the management. First of all, scouting. That is the basis of any pest management program, regardless of pest, whether it's voles or what have you. You need to know what's out there. Slugs are nocturnal. And so really, if you want to catch them in the act, you've got to go out after sundown to look for them. This is the best way to actually assess their populations. You can see the damage during the day, but if you want to know if you is your field teeming with slugs or just a few, you got to go look at night. So go out after sundown. It is a good idea to monitor those populations in the fall. Why? Because those are the same slugs that are going to be your population for the following spring. They, they aren't really like highly mobile. If you've got a field in the fall with a lot of slugs, that's the field you're going to have problems with in the spring. You also want to monitor in the spring because that's when the damage is going to happen. And uh, rescue treatments, there are some uh, slug baits. I'm going to talk a little bit about those. Um, we don't really have good thresholds, I'm sorry to say. With a lot of insect pests, we can say, well, if you have this many, we recommend treating. With slugs, we just don't have enough research to have those thresholds. So it's sort of a go with your gut if you really feel like your plant stand is in trouble. It's time to take action. Now, I know this is a no-till conference, but really, slug management, one of the primary tools is, unfortunately, tillage. Uh, we have some pictures here that Ron Hammond took in his career. This is the slug damage in a heavy residue field. You know, it doesn't look too bad, it just looks like kind of thin corn stand in a heavy residue field. But then the next picture is the same field, just a different part of the field that had light tillage and residue removal. Same field, same day. You can see the difference in the corn, if I can get my thing going. Yeah, so that's without, that's with the heavy residue. That is with light tillage and residue removal. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, planting early is another defense because you want to hit that window of getting your plants up and kind of going while the slugs are still small so that you experience less proportional damage. And any tactics that you can use to kind of give those plants a head start, uh, any agronomic practices or tricks you have up your sleeve to give them a boost and accelerate their growth. The bigger the plant, yeah. when the slugs are small, the better off you're going to be yeah. you're going to get ahead of them a little bit. So I'll talk a little bit about the slug baits that are out there. There are two basic kinds, metaldehyde. This is the product in Deadline, or uh, Metarex, and then iron phosphate baits. That would be Sluggo, Ferox, and uh, maybe one or two others. And that's a pretty limited chemical arsenal uh, to be working with. Both of these products are formulated as baits. They have to be ingested by the slug. It's not a contact thing. Um, so they're formulated as uh, baits that the slugs eat. And another drawback of these products is that they can be quite expensive. 
Okay, metaldehyde is uh, the number one rescue product. It's from a Swiss manufacturer, the only company in the world that manufactures the active ingredient. Um, they recommend a 5% active ingredient formulation for slug management. Now, most U.S. formulations that you're going to find range from 3.5 to 4%. So even the most of them is less than what's recommended by the manufacturer. Some products are even less than this. So when you are choosing a slug control product with metaldehyde, you want to look at the active ingredient and see how much there is. Some of the home and garden products, for example, are 2% uh, active ingredient. And when you have those subtoxic doses, um, slugs can recover. So uh, it's kind of not really um, worth your investment to go with a, a lower active ingredient. So look for the highest percent active ingredient you can find. Metaldehyde is approved for broadcast application on corn and soybean. Um, for example, Deadline MP. MP stands for mini pellets. They come in little um, bite-sized pellets for the slugs. Uh, corn, the broadcast rate is 25 pounds an acre, and soybean, it is 10 pounds an acre. Why the difference? I do not know, um, but there it is. This is the, de uh, this is the uh, uh, label for Deadline MP, showing that you can have a total number of applications per season in either corn or soybean of three per season. <coughs> now, actually, I think this would probably be um, cost prohibitive but it's allowed. Good coverage is important, but it can be tricky getting it spread right because it's not really, doesn't spread the same as some other products you might work with more. And this shows a skip in the field where it was just poor coverage. I think the most um, useful uh, tool is an ATV with a spreader on it. Look, excuse me a minute, I need to cough. <coughs> So, does this bait work? Well, it can work. Um, this is a, uh, I can show you graphs and figures, but sometimes both will be so much more. Thank you, a picture is worth more. This is again from Ron Hammond's work where he had uh, plots with bait and plots without bait. So, obviously, the bait was doing some good there. So it can work, but did it work? You always want to go out and check and see uh, if you are getting um, the action that you wanted. Um, go back, check after the application, check after dusk and look for the slugs themselves, but also look at the plants themselves and look if you have new plant growth that's undamaged. If in this situation we've got new soybean trifoliates that are undamaged, uh, we stop the problem, whereas here we've got new trifoliates that are still getting eaten. We have not stopped the bleeding for that. Iron phosphate bait, uh, some of this is approved for organic farming, some formulations. Uh, generally speaking, not as effective as metaldehyde. Um, typically you need a higher rate and it's usually more expensive. Now, um, the older formulation of uh, iron phosphate that was most commonly sold was a product called Sluggo. And uh, I have heard that there is a newer formulation called Ferox that has a, a different formulation of the iron. And I've heard it might be more effective, but I have not seen any research data on this, so I think we need to learn a little bit more about this. So, I'm going to touch in my last few minutes here on other approaches that one can take with slugs. Uh, nitrogen solutions. Has anyone ever heard of the trick of trying to spray them with nitrogen? I'm seeing a few, few hands here. Um, this is, if you're going to try this, you have to do it with the rule of three. You want to do it uh, at three in the morning, three nights in a row, at 30% nitrogen. Now, I don't know that you need to take this literally. I don't I think it's fine if it's 2 a.m. instead of 3, but the point being you got to do it late at night when the slugs are most active because this is a contact thing. It's got to get on their bodies. They can't just come across it later. Um, and uh, just another note, this rate of nitrogen could uh, be phytotoxic, particularly for soybeans, so use with care. Now, does, does it work? I have only found one uh, scientific study looking at the efficacy of this. This is by a Galen Dively at the University of Maryland, 
and he looked, this is the number of slugs per plant in the untreated check in a five gallon solution, 10 gallon solution, that's 10 gallons of urea and 10 gallons of water, and 20% uh, where you're getting pretty hot there. But anyway, he had a significant reduction in the number of slugs per plant with this uh, 10 gallon um, nitrogen solution. So, you know, if you, if you want to fiddle with that, I don't know if it's legal, I honestly couldn't tell you, but one study does say it may do something. But again, it's not something you just do once and forget it, you have to do it two or three times. Lanate, that is an insecticide that is actually labeled for slugs in corn and soybean in certain states, including Ohio. Now, most insecticides don't even touch slugs. They're not insects, they don't have the same physiology, the biology is different, but this insecticide is labeled for slugs. Again, this is a contact thing. It's got to get on them. Ron Hammond told me, he sat down in my office and I said, what about this landing? He said, well, for every one person who says it works, I hear three or four say it doesn't. I could only find one published scientific study on lanate. This was uh, researchers in Delaware, the state of Delaware, not Delaware, Ohio. Um, and they looked at lanate compared to other things, and they found that five days after treatment, there was no difference in slug damage or slug counts between the lanate and the untreated check. So they didn't find it to be effective in that one study that I could find. So I'm going to touch on some interesting new research that's happening. This is work from John Tucker, who's an entomologist at Penn State University. And he was looking at the relationship between ground beetles, slugs, and neonicotinoid seed treatments. I'll take you back to the slug food chain where predators, particularly ground beetles, uh, are very important as predators of slugs. <coughs> the lions of no-till field. This is a up close to the brown beetle, these are predatory beetles. This is the immature form of the beetle. It doesn't look much like a beetle, it looks sort of like a wireworm or something, but it is, well, wireworms are beetles too, but anyway, this is the immature form of the beetle. <coughs> these two graphs in alfalfa and corn show that the more carabins, that's uh, ground beetles you have, the lower the slug damage. Ground beetles are good for slug biological control, but this research is also looking at how pesticides can interfere with this positive biological control. In particular, neonicotinoid seed treatments. These are insecticides very commonly used these days. Um, they go onto the uh, seed coat, the plants germinate, the product gets taken up and distributed into the plant. It's a systemic insecticide. So it gets taken into the plant tissue of germination. What happens? Ugh. Well, this is the number of slugs per trap in a study where they had the blue line was untreated soybeans and the red line was in neonicotinoid seed treated soybeans. There are more slugs in the neonicotinoid treated fields. What's going on with that? Well, John and his students did a uh, field trial with quarter acre sized plots where they had treated and untreated uh, soybean seeds. This is, uh, and then they went and they measured the concentration of the neonicotinoid <coughs> from those different plots. So they measured the, the, how much neonicotinoid is occurring in the plants from the treated plots and the untreated plots. So as expected, lots of neonic in the plants in the treated plots, a little bit in the untreated. Why? Because um, this product stays in the ground and if you plant there the next year, even if it's untreated seed, they can take up a little bit from the ground because it hasn't broken down yet. Then they looked at slug bodies and how much neonic are you finding in the slug bodies. <coughs> In the untreated fields, plots, you have no neonic in the slug's bodies, but you have rather a lot of the neonicotinoid in slugs that are living in the treated plots. So that's interesting. So the thymophytes was taken up by the plant. The slugs eat the plant. They take in the thymophytes. That's the uh, neonicotinoid that they looked at. It's the active ingredient in cruiser. 
Um, this insecticide does not harm the slugs, but it comes into their body and then they excrete it in their slime. So these are toxic slugs, long comes the beetle and eats the slug that has the toxin inside of it. What happens? Uh, let's see if my movie <coughs> will work. Back, could, it, could you hover over down near the bottom there and see if you can bring up a little arrow? Uh, let's go back. Just hover near the bottom of the picture. Yeah, yeah. Now hit that little arrow. This is a ground beetle that has kind of licked a, tox a toxic slug. Let's see if this works. I don't think so. Not going? Okay. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. <coughs> so I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll act out what happens. So it eats the slug, and then it starts to kind of twitch a little, and pretty soon it's on its back with the slugs going around like this. Very dramatic. You probably have more fun seeing me do it than you have seen. <laughs> So looking at this in a data sort of way, this is some data that they took from this study. This is the slug, the number of slug predators, the beetles, in their traps, and the proportion of slugs killed. So the more beetles you have, the more predation you have. Well, we kind of do that, but the thing that's also interesting about this is that the white dots, the greater predation is predation that's going on in the untreated soybeans. Whereas down here where you have the neonic treated soybeans, you have a much lower number of ground beetles and you have a much lower rate of slug predation. So under other approaches, I would say that avoiding using those neonic seed treatments when you don't need them for specific pests is a really good idea. Now I'm not talking about fungicide seed treatments. This is specifically referring to the insecticide <laughs> Uh, it can be hard to find seeds that have the fungicide if you want that, but without the uh, insecticide, but you can get them. Uh, that's generally a good practice. Um, many people do not need that neonic except in some very specific um, situations. For example, if they are planting into CRP, and there's a lot of weird soil insect pests when you're planting into CRP, land that's coming out of CRP. Uh, Cover crops, that's something that I think is going to be very important and relevant for slug management. There are definitely some cover crops that are more attractive to slugs than others, but actually maybe having an attractive cover crop could in a way help you with your slugs. This is also work that uh, John Tucker did on farm with the uh, Criswell family in Pennsylvania. And this was an on-farm trial where the growers realized uh, they made an observation. If you have clean fields, um, there's nothing else there for the slugs to eat. They're going to eat your crop. Also, when you have clean fields, there's not much habitat for those natural enemies, for those good ground beetle. So they tried a rye intercrop with their corn. And then this is the, the first year of the study. They found, this is looking at slug damage to corn. This is no rye, and this is rye. So they had lower damage to their corn when there was a rye intercrop. This is the number of ground beetles in no rye and rye. They had more ground beetles when they had that rye intercrop. And then the next stage of their work, and this is kind of ongoing right now, so I don't really uh, have much to show you, but their next uh, iteration of this is planting into rye. So this is not something that I personally have done research on yet, but I would really like to, um, to look at the role that cover crops can play because I think they may be um, very relevant for slug management and we definitely need more research in this area.